Hello. My name is Dr. Keith Dobson. I'm a professor of clinical psychology at the University of Calgary in Canada. You can see my logo behind me here for my university. Uh, it's my privilege today to be interviewed by myself as an ABCT international influencer. Uh, it's quite a privilege to be recognized in this way and so I'm happy to share with you some of my thoughts. I've been told to keep this to about 15 to 20 minutes so I'll try to be succinct and I've decided to do the interview myself. So I have a series of questions that I'll go through and give you some of my thoughts. One of the first questions I had was what led to my personal interest in clinical psychology and in particular to CBT. So to explain the answer there, I guess I have to go back somewhat in my own personal history. Uh, I'm one of five boys uh, raised on a farm or you know, set of farms. My family moved a little bit while I was growing up until we eventually ended up on a small farm where I finished my high school. Uh, very rural setting. My father finished high school, had no post-secondary education. My mother had two years of post-secondary education before she became married and started having children. Uh, went back later in life to get her Bachelor of Education, became a teacher, and then ultimately actually uh, obtained her Master's of Education after I had left home, grown and left home. In school, in school, when we were growing up, we were um, certainly encouraged to be academically oriented. Uh, there wasn't huge pressure in the school that I was in, I have to say. It was very rural again, and a lot of the uh, children there didn't have the aspiration to go to post-secondary. So I was one of a very small number of people who went on to university. Uh, but when I moved, and again, it, it required a physical move out of home, I, I was 17 at the, the time, um, I, I really enjoyed myself, to, to say the least. Uh, really made sense to me. I started in sociology. In my first year, I decided I didn't like that particularly, and I thought psychology was more relevant to people and uh, never looked back, really. By the end of my undergraduate, I was very much set on becoming a therapist. Um, given the training I had had, I was really keen on becoming a psychoanalyst in particular because I had been reading Freud and you know, re related uh, authors and so on. But uh, over time, I actually became aware of the new approach, which is sort of the more evidence-based approach. And for my graduate school, I went to Western University, as it was called the University of Western Ontario at the time, which had a very strong evidence-based uh, practice. And again, just to provide context, I was going to university back in the 1970s. So this was well before CBT had a firm foothold or had become, as it is now, the dominant approach to psychotherapy. Um, however, at the University of Western Ontario, I was fortunate to work with Brian Shaw, who was a person himself, a psychologist, who had had the privilege of working with Dr. Aaron Beck. And in fact, the Cognitive Therapy of Depression book, which most people know, uh, is Beck, Rush, Shaw, and Emery. So he was one of the original co-authors published in 1979. So I was there right at that time. And I very much got caught up in the zeitgeist and the enthusiasm and interest. Uh, in fact, I began to work with Brian Shaw directly. I did a postdoc study with him, which was funded by the National Institutes of Mental Health in the United States, which was a comparative trial of cognitive therapy, interpersonal therapy, and pharmacotherapy in the treatment of depression. And through that, had the enormous opportunity to meet some of the leaders in the field of depression research very early coming out of graduate school. Um, I stayed with that project for a couple of years because it became clear to me that I was not going to be publishing articles in the short term. And I wanted an academic career by then. And so I moved to Vancouver to the University of British Columbia, where I began doing my own depression research but had the great fortune there of hooking up with Dr. Uh, Neil Jacobson, who was a faculty member at the University of Washington in Seattle, not that far from Vancouver. And we began collaborating with several outcome studies looking at the treatments of depression. Uh, so I was doing research in Vancouver with myself. I was doing some of the work continuing with Brian Shaw. I had this international collaboration with Neil Jacobson and really from there never looked back. Uh, I moved in 1989 to Calgary, where I am now, uh, became the director of the clinical psychology program, the first director, because we just got it going at that time. 
Um, and since then, again, set up a depression research laboratory here, did trials here, continued my international collaborations, began to get involved in organize, uh, organized psychology. So I had a term as the president of the Canadian Psychological Association. I've been president of several international associations at this point in the field of CBT. Very much invested in evidence-based practice and the growth of the discipline of psychology as an evidence-based field. Um, who had the most influence in my career? Again, I think I've just named some of those people. Uh, Dr. Shaw, Dr. Beck, who I had the opportunity to work with as well through some of that early work. Uh, Neil Jacobson, certainly. Through Neil, uh, I was able to make contact with people like Steve Holland. And then again, international collaborations. Uh, some of my key collaborations include Nick Kazansis, who's a psychologist in Australia, uh, and, and others. I mean, again, I've had lots of opportunity around the world. One of the other things I've been able to do is travel a fair bit. And so through my international travel and presentations, I've been able, again, to make contacts uh, all over the place. So it's been an extremely rewarding career with lots and lots of connections. I was asked to talk about my what I see as my most important contribution. And I guess I would actually cite three domains. Uh, one is certainly the work in depression. So some of those articles that I was co-author on are some of the most cited articles in the field still. Um, one of the important papers that I really think about was a component analysis that Neil, and, Neil Jacobson and I uh, were co-PIs on looking at the effective ingredients of cognitive therapy for depression, which again, I think is still a citation classic and I know has been reprinted in, in different places. But in addition to my depression research, about 15 years ago, I was invited more locally to get involved in some work looking at using, again, evidence-based processes and principles to help people who had had adverse childhood experiences but were suffering from adult health and physical health and mental health problems and uh, was involved in an ACES project, Adverse Childhood Experiences Project here in Calgary, which had a huge impact and, and actually uh, yielded some very significant data, which I don't think is well known as it should be yet, uh, given the importance of adverse childhood experiences for adult development. Um, but that was an important piece of research. And then most recently, I've been involved with an organization in Canada called the Mental Health Commission of Canada, and the Mental Health Commission's work has different arms, but one of them is focused on stigma. And so I have been working in the group that's focused on stigma reduction, primarily in the workplace. And through that collaboration, I've had, again, the opportunity to work with people in various disciplines, various uh, organizations around the world looking at this issue of stigma. And I've been publishing primarily, in fact, in that area in the most recent years. Um, and again, what we're doing there is using psychological knowledge and principles and the development of evidence-based practice as a guiding framework for stigma reduction programs. So again, it's another application of psychological principles and processes. I was asked to talk about how we can do a better job of disseminating CBT to clinicians. Um, and in fact, when I read that question, I, I sort of had a negative reaction, I have to confess, because I don't think this is at all a one-way uh, transmission of you know, research to practice. Um, I think that we actually historically have done a relatively poor job of the reciprocal relationship, learning from practice and then trying to change our theories and models and research to fit that. But again, in recent years, I've been very interested in the whole process of dissemination. So again, taking what we know from theory research, translating it into research, but then taking the practice you know, and what we learn from practice and then converting that back into the second iteration or third iteration of our theories and our models. So I think we've done a reasonably good job of translating research into practice. What we've not done as good a job of is translating practice back into theory and research. So I think this is an area where we certainly we could be doing more. The other thing I guess I think about is that it's the concern is for me is not so much translating research into practice for clinicians, but translating research into demand from the public and funding support in the policy realm. I think, again, we've got a number of well-developed, well-established uh, interventions from CBT and from evidence-based practice in general. 
And I think that the public, at least in the Western world, has become savvy and certainly demands uh, access to services as they can. But we know that the access is absolutely insufficient. There aren't enough trained professionals. Uh, the funding methods and models are inadequate. Even in countries with socialized medicine, like Canada is where I live, um, our access to mental health services is woefully inadequate. And especially the access to evidence-based interventions is woefully inadequate. So I think our real target at this point should not be so much clinicians, but it should be the public and encourage them to demand of the policymakers that they get access to the services in a way that's responsible and, and will help them optimize their health. So, so to me, that's our real next uh, target of opportunity. And to me, that's the biggest uh, obstacle too, again, which was the next question about the biggest challenge. I think it's funding. Um, I saw recently a World Health Organization uh, document published 2021, their fact book, it said 2.1% of all global health services dollars are in the field of mental health. So this is not all, no, not all public funding, just public funding or health, government funding in the area of health, 2.1%. So that's an inadequate amount of funding uh, completely. And, and we know healthcare, of course, is probably generally inadequately funded, but 2.1% is a pittance, uh, frankly, and that would include all professions. So that doesn't include just CBT or evidence-based therapies. That would also include pharmacotherapies and the wide range of other interventions, including hospitalizations, which of course are incredibly expensive. So I think we uh, need to, again, focus on the funding uh, at the public level, at the government level. The other thing I would mention about funding is that we know that in fact, funding varies dramatically around the world. So that in the developed world, in the highest income countries, uh, again, the public funding is probably more in the range of 4%, but in some countries it falls much, much below 2% of, of gross domestic product. So, so this is a real issue, I, I think, without a doubt. Another question that I was asked to address is about recent findings in the field of psychopathology and mental health that are likely to have the biggest impact on our future practice and, and research. And um, I would say this is not really a recent finding or recent knowledge, but it's the application that I think is growing. And this is the application focused on transdiagnostic work. Um, again, when I think about the history of CBTs, we were extremely fortunate in a sense in that the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the fourth version, when it was published in 1980, was exactly at the time when CBTs were starting to get going. Uh, and again, I mentioned earlier the Cognitive Therapy of Depression book published in 1979. So, so again, the timing here was, was you know, very um, aligned. And so what happened, of course, in the 1980s and 1990s is that we were able to get funding for a large number of intervention studies using diagnostic-related groups using a descriptive diagnostic system, so, so the dsm 4 as it was at the time. And that significantly promoted the development of CBT as an evidence-based practice. And the fact that those came together, again, historically, um, I think was a godsend, frankly, for, for the field of CBT. Since then, of course, changes have, have come along with both our diagnostic frameworks and our, our research. And we now know that a lot of the interventions we use actually work cross-diagnostically or transdiagnostically. And so we've been able now to use the evidence base to go back and look at some of the models again and some of the ways in which we conceptualize issues. And just one very quick example that I've done some publishing in again is the field of avoidance. So we now know that avoidance is a high transdiagnostic feature for both anxiety and depression. And my suspicion, again, is that in the years to come, we will recognize increasingly factors that cut across diagnoses for which CBT has very strong and effective interventions. So, so again, that's just one example. The other thing that I think is in the same vein, but you know, maybe a slightly different perspective, is the development of models, again, that look at the whole person. So one of the things that I believe in very much is the biopsychosocial model of development. 
Uh, CBT, I think, has been very much a psychosocial model, so looking at the person and his or her belief systems in interaction with social and environmental determinants. Um, and I think as time goes on, again, we're going to see a more integrated biopsychosocial framework for many disorders, which again will permit more transdiagnostic work, will also permit, permit more work doing uh, intervention development and evaluation from a variety of perspectives, more, more transdisciplinary work, which of course is a trend in the field. Changes, uh, I was asked to talk about changes in graduate training and education, and I guess I've got two sort of reactions here. One is when I think about the North American model, and, and by that I mean the US and Canada model, we have a very regimented system of accreditation of doctoral programs in psychology, which I think actually works very well. Um, you know, I've been involved in the development and review of accredited programs, both in Canada and the United States for a number of years myself. I think if anything, our training models in North America are overdeveloped and um, are somewhat excessive compared to the actual demands of the average graduate and uh, could be scaled back. So that, that would be my overall opinion. When I think about the rest of the world, I'm mindful also that there are many different training programs. So for example, if you think about continental Europe, most of the people that go into graduate uh, training in psychology and become psychotherapists uh, don't obtain a doctoral degree. Uh, it's much more typical that they either obtain a licensing degree uh, or they obtain a master's degree or, or equivalent, what we would consider a master's equivalent in North America. But it makes them absolutely eligible to practice and to use CBT and evidence-based therapies. Uh, what they don't have then is some of the research training and some of the broader uh, disciplinary training that we see in North America associated with the bachelor's degrees. But again, I think you could make the argument that, that you know, some of the training we do here is excessive. I'm mindful that people uh, are moving around the world, of course, with their degrees, and they want to practice when they move. And I'm very mindful that people often come, for example, to Canada from Europe uh, or other parts of the world that are under uh, European influence, and they're not able to practice. They don't have a doctoral degree, so they don't meet licensing standards. And I think, that, again, this is a, a terrible inadequacy of our current regulation. So I think overall, I would like to see North American training standards lowered somewhat. I'd like to see more transportability of credentials uh, globally, and again, possibly tied again to professional competencies as opposed to coursework and degrees, as we often focus on now. Uh, if I was asked to talk about advice, uh, what advice would I give to graduate students and trainees interested in CVT? I would say my general advice, and this is the advice I've given my, my own children and uh, I would give to anybody really, is to follow your passion. You know, look, look at the areas that are of interest to you, um, you know, move in those directions, find mentors or people or opportunities that you can work at where you are doing the work that you're most interested in. Uh, your passions may change, of course, your interests may change over your lifespan. Your opportunities may change and give you new opportunities and new things that you weren't even aware of. But, you know, generally follow the things that you're interested in and you'll be the happiest. Um, of course, within those areas, do the best you can. You know, again, look for, for you know, the people and, and the sources of inspiration that are going to move you forward. So those would be my general pieces of advice. Last, second last question rather was, how do I see CBT evolving in the next 10 years? And this is always a, a tricky question because of course nobody knows the future, but uh, when we look again over the past you know, 10, 20 years and then imagine the trends that we've been facing, will they continue? And I guess when I look back over the last 10 or 20 years, I would say the biggest trend I've seen in the field is towards more flexibility. Um, so again, if we go back to the 1980s and 1990s, when a lot of the work was focused on diagnostic related groups, the interventions tended to be fairly simplistic, relatively speaking, um, and they tended to be fairly structured, you know, much, much more structured than, than you see today. And they tended to be what, what I would almost think of it as a monotherapy in the sense that there was one primary uh, target of intervention might might be approached different ways or with you know, different tools, but for the most part, they were fairly simplistic, like I said. 
And what's happened over time as the field has grown and as the evidence base has grown, and as we have had some feedback now from practice into theory, um, I think what we're finding is that there are often different ways to approach the same clinical problem and that flexibility makes sense for many disorders and uh, for different presentations, different individuals you know, have slightly different ways of thinking about themselves and different interventions are going to work better for some people than others. So I've seen this growth of increased flexibility. Um, there's been talk in the field, as some of you would know, about the different waves of CBT. So the first wave being primarily behavioral, the second one being more cognitive and behavioral, and the third wave you know, focusing on mindfulness and uh, related kind of interventions. So the third wave, I don't actually see it that way. I, I don't believe these were formally waves, because in fact, if you go back historically and look at when these different approaches developed, they all developed more or less at the same time. Um, but again, you know, again, from a conceptual framework, I can see the, the wave metaphor being used. Um, but I see the idea again about more flexibility. And again, I think this partly goes with the idea about transdiagnostic work. And it also goes partly with the integration of biopsychosocial frameworks and the idea that you can look at the same problem from somewhat different perspectives and possibly lead to a better outcome. So, so if I was a predicting person, that would be my, my general prediction. The other thing that I think, again, that, that kind of fits in with this is the movement that I see towards globalization, that we are seeing the interventions that have been developed in one place or another uh, and developed and, and disseminated there being taken and practiced elsewhere too. And as we learn more about what works and doesn't work as we globalize CBT, we are actually developing the field in, in many ways, in many different ways. I, and again, the, the last part of that globalization effort, I think we're going to see in mental health generally, as is true right across the board in health, is this push towards evidence-based practice. So um, again, I, I think you know the public demands that our healthcare systems are as evidence-based as possible, that we can justify the work we do based on our research, but also based on good practical sense and you know, our knowledge about what does and doesn't work for different clients in different times. And so again, I think this general push towards globalization and evidence practice will be one of the dominant themes for the next 10 to 20 years, I would guess. And then the last question I was asked about here is, what areas or issues do you feel CBT needs to address more in the future? And I was thinking about that one a little bit before I started this recording. And I guess there are four domains that I would just like to briefly uh, talk about as the domains that I, th I think are those that we really need to focus on. And I've already hinted at some of them. And, and they do vary somewhat from different parts of the world again. So one of these I think is aging. Um, when you look at the aging profile of most countries uh, in Europe and in North America uh, and, and Latin America as well, uh, what we see is a profile of people that is getting significantly older. The average age is going up still. Um, you know, and again, in North America and Europe, this is the baby boomer phenomenon. Um, but uh, this is a phenomenon that, that's happening in many different countries of the world. Um, mental health in aging actually is interesting because, uh, in fact, the in North America at least, the average mental health needs of the an aging person are fewer than they are for younger adults. So teens and early early adults tend to have highest needs for mental health services, uh, but the nature of the mental health services changes so that in in older adults. They tend to become more chronic conditions and of course they can involve deterioration cognitive deterioration or intellectual problems um, and of course loss long-term loss associated with uh, death and dying and of one's family and friends and so on so so i think the nature of the uh, issues that are faced are different they've not been as well developed as they could be up until now uh, and again i think part of that is ageism in our society that that older people are not necessarily given the same attention. So I do think that that's an area for development um, with, without, a date, and without a doubt, and especially, like I say, North America and Europe, but other countries as well. A second area, unfortunately, is, I believe, trauma and refugeeism. 
Um, just very recently in North America, we've seen the horrific invasion of the Ukraine from, from Russia uh, and all of the refugees associated with that uh, invasion. We've also had multiple other recent incidents, incidents in the world that have led to refugeeism, including the Syrian refugee crisis, which continues uh, unabated, uh, the Rohingya refugees, uh, you know, out of Myanmar, um, you know, we, the, the issues that are going on in uh, Latin America and South America, rather. Uh, so again, there, there are many different instances where refugeeism happens. We also can anticipate, unfortunately, with global warming, that there's going to be increased ecological refugeeism. And what I mean are people who are living in drought conditions or uh, conditions where the environment makes it impossible to live. Uh, some parts of the world where sea levels are rising and um, islands where people live or shorelines where they live are just not going to be habitable for in the future. So we're going to see refugeeism associated with those kinds of issues as well. And the world really needs to learn how to um, understand and, and I think optimally help people in mobility. And again, I hinted earlier in psychology how I think mobility is going to influence uh, this discipline, but it's going to be affecting many, many people around the world in unfortunate ways and some of which we can't even anticipate. So I think that that's an issue is, is uh, you know, trauma, refugeeism as a general theme. The third theme I would mention is prevention. Um, again, I think up until now, and again, it makes perfect sense that as we're developing interventions, we would focus on people who have a condition and need assistance. Um, you know, so I think our development up until now makes perfect sense. But a lot of the principles and practices that we use can actually be used in a preventive strategy method. And of course, there is work like this that's being done, so taking interventions. Um, I think of the Coping Cat program, for example, developed by Phil Kendall and colleagues, um, and the way that it began with as a treatment program, but is now being used as a prevention program as well for childhood anxiety. So, so there's a number of examples like that I can think of where we can take the work that we know and, and again, use it in a more proactive way to reduce suffering uh, rather than treating it once it occurs. And then the final area, I think, for the future of the field is one I've already hinted at, which is funding and policy. Um, again, I believe, um, well, I don't just believe, I, I know that our funding for mental health services is inadequate. Um, you can not find a country in the world where I believe where people are getting adequate care, with one exception, perhaps, which is the UK, um, but even there, uh, what I understand is that even though services are much more evidence based and much more focused on uh, the interventions that work, uh, it's only for limited numbers of disorders. So again, when you step outside of certain conditions, then the access to services is probably not what it needs to be. So I think there's no country in the world really where we have the full range of mental health services that is necessary and is funded with the right number of providers at the right level and the right places. Uh, so this, again, maintains a, a global imperative. Recently, I've become involved in an organization called the World Confederation of Cognitive and Behavioral Therapies. I'm the current president, in fact. Um, and again, for those of you that don't know this organization, it's an organization of organizations. So it's a confederation. Um, so for example, we have uh, our members include ABCT, uh, they include the European Association of Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies, the Asian Association, and, and so on. And so very much, you know, our goal is to have local organizations do work that meets the local needs, like the national need uh, or the European need in the case of the European Association. Um, and our job then is to promote CBT globally. So we're trying to work with groups like the World Health Organization, the United Nations, um, to really, again, uh, let them know about the av availability of the work that can be done through CBT and, of course, to promote knowledge and dissemination globally as appropriate. So to me, again, this is a very exciting and new and critical uh, aspect of the growth and development of CBT. So, so to me, again, this fits in with the funding policy development that I was hinting at. Overall, it's been an amazing career. I started my undergraduate in 1970s. 
I got my PhD in 1980, actually. So if you want to time me, I've been in the field now, you know, for almost 50 years. And the amount of growth and development is just unbelievable. You know, so, so remarkable. Things that we could never have anticipated are present now. So it's been a remarkable um, you know, journey for me. It's been fantastic to be part of the organizational development, to be able to see new colleagues applying CBT in ways that I think we never could have anticipated, you know, even 30 years ago. So where we'll be 30 years from now is really very difficult to say, but I suspect it's going to be an incredible journey.